أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والنازعات غرقا والناشطات نشطا والسابحات سبحا فالسابقات سبقا فالمدبرات أمرا يوم ترجف الراجفة تتبعها الرادفة قلوب يومئذ واجفة أبصارها خاشعة يقولون أئنا لمغدودون في الحافرة أئذا كنا عظاما نخرة قالوا تلك إذا كرة خاسرة فإنما هي زجرة واحدة فإذا هم بالساهرة الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله تعالى we're beginning our study of سورة النازعات today the first comment uh, very briefly that we'll make is that it's a Makki surah just like the surah before it سورة النبا and we're going to try to understand the conclusion of Surah Al-Naba connected to the introduction to Surah Al-Nazi'at. Towards the end of Surah Al-Naba, the surah right before this one, Allah Azza wa Jal said, يَوْمَ يَقُومُ الرُّوحُ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ صَفًّا لَا يَتَكَلَّمُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ الرَّحْمَانِ وَقَالَ الصَّوَابَ ذَلِكَ الْيَوْمُ الْحَقِّ There was reference over and over again to the final day, the last day. That's the conclusion of Surah Al-Naba. Right after the introductory comments of this surah are done, we go back to the last day again. يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَةِ تَتْبَعُهَا الرَّادِفَةِ قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ Again, يَوْمْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ وَاجِفَةِ أَبْصَارُهَا خَاشِعَةِ And we get to these ayat, inshallah, we'll see the commentary on them. But it seems like it's a continuation with a small lapse. It's again a continuation of that final day. How the previous surah concluded is tied to the introduction of this surah. Now, in the beginning of the surah, there are a series of oaths, aqsam. And this is a dedicated subject in the Qur'an, al-aqsam fil Qur'an al-hakim. Allah Azza wa Jal, He swears by things. So before we talk about the, the, these oaths particularly, we need to understand some fundamental things about aqsam in the Qur'an, the oaths in the Qur'an. From among the tabi'un and the earliest of scholars, there has been commentary on the function and the, the wisdom of the oaths in the Qur'an. And one of the most common opinions has been that when Allah swears by something, it is something sacred or something powerful or something awe-inspiring. So for instance, Allah Azza wa Jal, He swears by the sun, shamsi wa duhaha, or by the moon, qamari idha talaha, or by the morning, subhi idha asfar, or by the bright morning, duha, or by the night, layli idha sajda. You know these famous oaths in the Qur'an, right? Or wal asr, right? These are many, many, many cases of oaths in the Qur'an. One of the opinions of the tabi'un has been that these oaths have to do with something sacred. But that in and of itself is not enough. There's more to know about the oaths than just, just that they are speaking of something sacred or, or honored by Allah Azza wa Jal. Actually, a contrary opinion also exists. For example, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah in his book Al-Mu'een fi Aqsam al-Qur'an, he dedicated himself just to the study of oaths in the Qur'an. And he says just saying that the oaths are sacred isn't enough. Because when we have watini wa zaytun wa tuli sinin wa hadha al-balad al-amin, these are oaths in one surah. And then you have some oaths in another surah, you know, shamsi wa duhaha wal qamari idha talaha. If the only thing to know is that they're sacred, then you can take the ones from here and put them there and take the ones from there and put them here. What difference does it make? There necessarily has to be more to it than that. So he argues that actually the fundamental thing to know is not the sanctity of the object that is being sworn by, but rather how it connects to the rest of the surah. So when an oath is taken, it is an introduction. It's, it's a powerful means of introducing a topic that is coming in the rest of the surah. And that's really how the entire precedent of the surah is set. For example, one of the biggest examples, or easiest to understand even, would be, لا أقسم بيوم القيامة. Allah Azza wa Jal in the beginning, He swears by two things. He swears by the day of resurrection, يوم القيامة, ولا أقسم بالنفس اللوامة, the blameworthy self. He swears by two things. When you study Surah Al-Qiyamah, you'll find only two things. You will find the mention of Al-Qiyamah, and you will find mention of the blameworthy self. 
كذا بل تحبون العاجلة فتذرون الآخرة etc etc right so these are only two things you're going to find in the entire surah connected to the intro introductory oaths that have been mentioned so long story short short some other things that you should know about oaths in daily speech in people's common discourse when is an oath used especially in ancient times it is used one when the audience that you're speaking to they don't believe what you're saying for example when you speak to someone you say to them i was i was at this place yesterday they don't believe you you say i swear i was there yesterday right and even we do this nowadays right in the olden times you had to swear by something to make yourself believable so i swear by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or something like this right even the mushrikun would swear by other things I would swear by, he would swear by his child, or by his tribe, or by his family, or by his health, right, that he was such a, at such and such place. So it's a means of giving testimony, which is why even in contemporary society, people take an oath or they swear before they testify in court. They have to swear that they're telling the truth. This is one function of oaths. Another function of oaths is that it, it is an illustration of anger. Because the one who swears is someone who is not being taken seriously or what they have to say isn't being given its full due so they are brought to a point where they have to swear. In common language nowadays we say to each other, man, I, I swear you better stop. Right? We say something like that. In, in, and when do we say this? Is when the other person is making us angry. Or two friends maybe in an argument and one of them might say, I, I swear I'm going to kill you if you don't do this or if you do this. Right? So they don't really mean it but it's an expression of anger. In Quran, sometimes the oath is an expression of anger. Other times it is an expression of, subhanahu wa ta'ala, expression of the idea that the, what is being presented coming forward is not being taken seriously by most people. Whatever is Allah is about to present, people are taking it lightly. So to give it importance and to make them realize this is a heavy thing, Allah Azza wa Jal swears. So this is the second reason. And by the way, when I use swear, I don't use it in the modern sense. You know, In, in the modern sense, to swear is to use profanity, right? to, use, to use foul language. But I mean it in the sense of the ancient English, like to take an oath by something. Then finally, the oath as a, as a consistent component of the Qur'an is necessarily an introduction or precursor to arguments that are coming in that surah, in that very surah. And that's what we're going to see here, insha'Allah ta'ala. For the very beginning oath, we have an naziat wa naziati ghafa. Allah swears by an naziat comes from naza, which means to yank something out violently, to pull something out with full force, okay? An naziat Allah swears by the ones that pull out. Gharqa having dive, uh, dove in. Gharq here is maf'ul mutlaq, actually, it's called. The, the grammatical term is maf'ul mutlaq, mutlaq min ghayri lafzihi. Meaning, it's used, the, the word gharqan is used to emphasize the act of pulling out without using the same root. Instead of saying, wan naziati naz'a, it's wan naziati gharqa. And the idea is, whatever Allah is swearing by, these are some creatures or some objects that dives deep in and yanks whatever is deep inside, pulls it out. The vast majority of the Mufassirun in regards to what these things are, they mention that these are angels, the vast majority of them. And they're actually sourced in one opinion. Baghwi reports on behalf of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu that uh, Ibn Abbas's opinion radiallahu anhu that, uh, that the Naziat and then uh, Anashitat and so on, all of the oaths here that have at at the end, all of them are referring to angels, and that's become the popular opinion among the Mufassirun. The second opinion about this is that these are an-nujum, that these are uh, the stars that, that also exist. For example, Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, his opinion is that these are stars that Allah is speaking about, stars that are, that are being yanked out of the sky or that are falling, which was from the experience of the Arabs when they would see a comment or, comment or something like that, that they would comment, this is nazar, right? It's been yanked out of the sky. Anyhow. The, the third opinion that I will present, inshallah, the, of these two, obviously, the most popular one is the angels. That's probably the one you've already heard also. But there is a third opinion that I would like to share and then tie them all together, inshallah ta'ala. The thing we have to understand about Qur'an is sometimes the text is ambiguous. Allah Azza wa didn't spell out explicitly that these are angels. First, that we should be honest and, and know that that is the case. Allah did not spell out specifically that these are angels. The second thing to note is when, the, uh, when there are a variety of opinions, that, uh, especially in the first generation, that in itself is an illustration that this was ambiguous. That in itself is a proof that this is not something mutlaq, it's not absolute, it's not one way and everything else is kufr. So you find in the history of the Mufassirun, you have arguments supporting, okay, this is an opinion, what are the evidences that make this opinion stronger than that opinion? Or what are the evidences that this opinion is rather weak as opposed to other opinions? So even though these opinions exist, 
there are opinions among later ulama that critique these opinions and try to weigh not just by popularity but by what other supporting evidence is there to see what opinion is the strongest. So I will present you one such opinion. One such opinion is that a nazi'at refers to the winds. That a nazi'at refers to winds. The alif ta at the end has been used consistently in the Quran in other places which with strong linguistic evidence that it's also winds. Al-mursalat, wal-mursalat yurfa, al-dhariyat, al-jariyat. There are many instances where the language suggests and the context suggests that they are in fact referring to winds. So one opinion is that it's referring to winds. But again, we already said, what's the most popular opinion? That it's the angels. So we have to try to figure out what, what criticism do these scholars have? For example, Islahi, rahimahullah, has the opinion that this is winds. What basis does he have? The first criticism that he offers is this, that an naziat is the feminine plural. It's called jama' mu'annas salim. Alif ta at the end. This is the feminine plural. And Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran speaks against attributing femininity to angels. In the Quran itself, Allah speaks against attributing femininity to angels. And he speaks about those who attributed femininity or, or, uh, to angels in one place. And another place, وَاتَّخَذَ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ inatha. Has your Lord taken daughters or, or from the angels he's taken these, these, uh, these feminine creatures, right? So there's a criticism in the Qur'an of this. The second issue that he brings up is when Allah does speak about angels in the Qur'an, what we find consistently is jama' mudakkar salim. We find munzilin, munzalin, musawwimin, murdafin, yadribuna wujuhahum wa adbarahum qalu. So you have these words that are all masculine in nature. When the plural, plurality of angels is mentioned consistently in the Qur'an, we find the, the masculine. Another case is that Allah Azza wa Jal, even when he does say something like qalatil malaika, for those of you who know a little bit of Arabic, qalat is feminine, right? So even when that does occur, that's not because of femininity, that's because of jam'a taksir. The broken plurals in Arabic, you use the feminine singular for them. So that's in the beginning. But after this, like if you say qalatil malaika, if you reverse it, you don't say al malaika tu qulna, you say al malaika tu qalu. So you use the ma masculine once again. Okay, so that's how it's found in the Quran. So that's his literary criticism. That in the Quran consistently the masculine is used. So why would this be angels if the feminine is being used? That's one criticism. The other criticism that's tied together with this is that you know how Allah Azza wa Jal uh, speaks about the, the soul being pulled out after the angels diving in gharqan, right? So that they're going into the body. But if you study the ahadith about the soul leaving, that the soul leaves from where, do you know? Where is it pulled out of? From the toe. From the toe, and the, uh, the 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 imagery depicted, and the depictions in the hadith are of such that the angels are not entering the body; yet they are pulling the soul out of the body. So he argues this as a criticism of this position. Also, furthermore, that it's not explicitly mentioned anywhere else. So we have both opinions now. We have a majority of ulama saying that this is angels, but also a pretty strong position that it's not. It may be something else. Now, how do you reconcile these two? This actually has to do with the versatility and the, the uh, comprehensive nature of the message of the Qur'an. We have to understand, first and foremost, Makkah Qur'an is talking to who? Who is it talking to? It's talking to people that don't believe. It's the, it's the kalam that's coming out of the mouth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that the angel has revealed to him, but the audience, the vast majority of them, are people that don't believe him. And when they hear these words, they're not going to come to him and say, give me tafsir of nazi'at. What is your opinion of what this means? They're not going to come. They hear this and they walk away. They take it for what at face value. So one of the most important considerations in interpreting Makkah Quran especially is when we use the when these words were used in the Quran, what was going on in the head of the Mushrik Arab? How did he understand these words? What you know, how was he processing this information? And that is the probably if you want to understand the methodology of da'wah in the Quran, that takes precedence. This doesn't nullify the other opinions because it may have relevance for us as Muslims in a more spiritual sense, in a deeper sense. But, and for the mushrik, perhaps in a more shallow sense, but still it has ref, you know, some, some relevance to him. And maybe the first thing that co doesn't come to the mushrik's mind is angels. The last thing you want to think is that the mushrik heard Qur'an and they said, what is that talking about? I don't get it. No, the Qur'an was very relevant, da'wah to the mushrik. It was, it was directly talking to him. And this is what baffled the mushrikun, that it, it, was, it was speaking to them in, lang in clear, in clear and clarifying Arab Arabic speech. So one more example of this before we go on to just, just wrap this subject up, inshaAllah. Allah Azza wa Jal says, يَعْلَمُ مَا يَلِجُ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَمَا يَخْرُجُ مِنْهَا He knows what enters into the earth and what comes out of the earth. 
When the mushrik hears that, what's he thinking? He's thinking of the rain going into the earth and the plant coming out of the earth. This is as far as his imagination goes. But when the believer hears that, there's more going on. There's deeper knowledge. And the deeper knowledge is, no, we also will go into the earth and we will also be coming out of the earth. So it's the same statement, but people are understanding it at different depths. So these are not contradictory statements I'm putting before you. These are at different levels, or different audiences are getting different levels of the same statement, appreciating different things. So Islahi's argument and others, basically the summary of it is, this is perhaps how the mushrik processed it. He thought of the wind. And then how would he then understand the rest of the message of the surah? But we keep the interpretation of the angels still, of course, as valid and majority. Anyhow. Finally, the evidence that, that is suggested among some scholars that this is referring to the winds is Allah Azza wa says, Inna arsalna alayhim rihan sarsaran fi yawmi nahsin mustamir tanzi'u nasa. The word tanzi'u in the Quran to snatch and yank out and pull out has been used for rih, has been used for wind. So he uses this as further supporting evidence. Anyhow, so if it is wind, then what this means is Allah is swearing by hurricane or tornado winds tornado winds that yank trees out of their roots or buildings out of their foundations like it's digging deep into the ground and pulling them out, plucking them out right away, right? And on the other hand, if this is referring to angels, it's the angels that are diving deep into the body and they are pulling and ripping the soul out that wants to stay inside the body. This is the soul of the kafir. nashtati nashta, And then nasht, nasht in the Arabic language, it, it refers to undoing a knot without making any effort. It refers to undoing a knot without making any effort. Another way nashta is used is when you, when you have a loose knot and you kind of leave the animal and it wiggles a little bit and kind of gets undone by itself without any effort, this is also where, where nashata is used. So this is maf'ul mutlaq, which means these winds or the angels, if it's referring to the angels, it's referring to angels that seamlessly enter the body and take out the soul. Very smooth process, like the undoing of a loose knot. No, pro no force necessary to, to, to apply. And if it's referring to the winds, it's referring to smooth breeze. The breeze that is a, a source of calm and peace and even pleasure on the face of the one experiencing it. So two contradictory kinds of winds, if this is wind, right? The winds that are a means of destruction and the, the winds that are a means of comfort and a, a means of even relaxation, of course, especially in desert uh, life. Then Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَالسَّابِحَاتِ سَبْحَا this, if referring to the angels, it's been interpreted as sabah, by the way, literally means to swim quickly or to swim in a, in a rapid, smooth way. You know, you can swim and you're splashing and you're, it's not smooth, but when you're swimming smoothly, then this is sabah, okay? So this it perhaps is referring to the angels as they dive in and they're diving inside the body of the person. That's how some ulama have commented on this, that they swim into the body seamlessly and they're looking for the soul and, and they're going to pull it out. Others have commented, no, th if this is the wind, these are the clouds that are swimming in the air, floating in the air by means of the clouds that are, or the, the winds that are pushing them. And then finally, فَالسَّابِقَاتِ sabqa. Then the, the word sabq is actually in the reference to race. When one thing is, is taking the lead over another, this is فَالسَّابِقَات. And there's a fa there, if you notice, those of you that are following along. What this means is it's connected to, to wasabihat. So wasabihati sabha, fasabihati sabqa are together. The others are separated, and we already knew that they were opposites, right? When naziati gharqa, when nashitati nashta were two very different kinds of wind, or very different kinds of angel situations. So they're separated by a wow. But wasabihati sabha, fasabihati sabqa is necessarily a process A and then B. A being wasabihati sabha, B being fasabihati sabqa. So the angels are racing back taking these souls, racing back for their judgment. Also the clouds, if you, from, the, from the view of the Arab, you would see the clouds, some of them moving faster than others, some of them taking the lead over the others. So this is part of the view of the Arab. فَالسَّابِقَاتِ sabqa. And then finally, فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ amra. This is a very powerful statement and should be understood both ways. One in, the terms, in terms of the angels that we spoke of and also in terms of the interpretation that it's wind. First of all, let's look at the word tadbir. The word mudabbirat is an ism fa'il from the word tadbir. That be me includes the meanings of planning, organization, ex executing a matter. It's complete, you know, uh, execution. And uh, it's similar, and uh, has contra contrast with another word that will come in this surah, where Allah says, "Thumma adbara yasa." It's a similar word, but it's a different structure, and it creates a different kind of meaning. But for now, understand that is thorough planning. 
thorough organization, thorough execution of a plan. So Allah is swearing by, again, fa, these sabihat, and fa sabiqat is uh, continuing these three, that these are the ones that execute the command of Allah, amra. Amran being the command, ma'ul bihi here. So Allah swears by those who execute the com command of Allah or, uh, diligently and in an organized fashion. If this is referring to the angels, it is the angels that are assigned different tasks by Allah Azza wa Jal, and they do a diligent, organized job of executing those commands. If it's referring to the clouds, as is the case in Surah Al-Mursalat, we find, وَالنَّاشِرَاتِ نَشْرَ فَالْفَارِقَاتِ فَقَّا Okay, there also we find, the, the, cloud, the, the winds, they distribute clouds in every direction. And the, these clouds are racing against one another. What else does the wind distribute? The wind also distributes dust and pollen. Also, by means of the winds, the clouds that are distributing, the clouds are going to bring rain. So if you think about it, winds are the means by which life is sustained on the earth. Everything you need for life on the earth is plant life, and plant life can't be sustained without pollen, which is, we know is now delivered by wind. And on the other hand, the rain from the sky, without which plant life can't exist, that's the clouds are delivered by the wind. So Allah has executed this organized plan of delivering these clouds. Some places won't get any. Some places will be dried up and become places of death and famine. And other places will be flooded with water. Other places will turn into lush gardens. All part of an executed plan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these plans being executed by means of the wind. So this is the other interpretation of fal mudabbirati amra. There are other words for planning that we should know about that are used in the Quran. So we use the word tadbir here, mudabbirat. Then we find the word kaid also. Like Allah says, فَإِن كَانَ لَكُمْ كَيْدٌ فَكِيدُونَ right? Also we find, وَكَذَلِكَ كِدْنَا لِيُوسُفُ What's the difference between tadbir, which is planning, and kaid, which is also planning? Kaid is actually a secret plan. The, the, the fundamental element in kaid is secrecy. So it's a plan which you don't want anybody else to find out about because part of it, exposing it will be to spoil the plan. It won't be any good if it comes out in the open. Another word used for planning is makr. And makr has an element of conflict in it. A plan that necessarily has to do with retaliation against an enemy. And when Allah is used with makr, like wa makaru wa makar Allah, wallahu khairul makirin, it's only used in the retali retaliatory sense. Meaning whenever Allah mentions that he's planning against an opposing force, it's always mentioned that they took the first step. They did makr first. So wa makaru first, and then wa makar Allah, wallahu khairul makirin. So there's a difference. We don't usually, normally, typically use makr with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless in that reaction to the makr that was done by the wrongdoer to begin with. Then finally, we have another word, hila. Hila like, وَالْوِلْدَانَ لَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ حِيلَةً Hila is a kind of plan that you make to... Uh, nowadays, there's a lot of hila in society, by the way. It's a, a, a clever plan. It's a clever plan. The idea of, of which is to maximize one's benefit or minimize one's harm without breaking the law, but at least trying to bend it, manipulating the system, working around the system. So accountants are really good at hila, for example, during tax season, right? Some of the scholars spoke about hila in the ancient times, in the times of Islamic rule, that the person would give all of their wealth as a gift to their wife right before zakat season, and then they would make it give, a, uh, make the wealth, uh, gift it back to them after zakat season is done. So this was a kind of, you know, working around the law. Don't get any ideas. but. <laughs> But, uh, you know, this was the kind of hila that was done before. Anyhow, so these are different kinds of plans. Allah Azza wa Jal specifically mentioned fal mudabbirati amra here, which, which the, the word includes planning, execution, organization, diligence, and actually actually means taking a step back before you take an action because it comes from dubr, which is the back of something. And it's to turn back from the affair, think it through, and then come back and can execute it. That, that's the, uh, the interpretation of the word tadbir. Anyway, now that Allah Azza wa Jal has taken an oath by these few things, when nazi'ati ghatta, by those who dive deep in and yank out, when nashitati nashta, those who sail smoothly, like the undoing of a knot, then, you know, fasabihati sabha, wasabihati sabha, fasabiqati sabha, those who swim or float, you know, effortlessly, seamlessly, those who race one against one another diligently, and then finally, those that plan the, or, or execute the affair with thorough planning, after all of these oaths, Allah Azza wa Jal moves on to another subject. And yes, last time we talked about the subject matter of Qur'an, paragraphs in the Qur'an, incredibly organized in the sense of even their rhyme scheme. So the first few were oaths in the Qur'an, and they all rhymed. So if you recite them, you will hear the rhyme scheme. وَالنَّازِعَاتِ غَرْقَى وَالنَّاشِطَاتِ نَشْطَى وَالسَّابِحَاتِ سَبْحَى فَالسَّابِقَاتِ سَبْقَى فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ أَمْرًا 
Now, if you look at the next few ayat, you'll just hear it even. Even if you don't hear, read tafsir, you'll hear it. يَوْمَ تَرْجُخُ الرَّاجِفَةِ تَتْبَعُهَا الرَّادِفَةِ قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ وَاجِفَةِ You hear the scream, right? Because it's, it's a united subject. So even phonetically, it's united, subhanAllah. Now we come to this next part, but before we do, understand that when an oath is taken, there's, there's what you, you took an oath, but now you want to say something. Like I swear by X, I'm going to do this. Now what that, I'm going to do this part. What am I swearing by? What is the statement that I'm about to make? That is actually hazaf here. It's mahzuf here. It's not mentioned. The reason it isn't mentioned is because this is a part of a series of, series of surahs where it has been mentioned. And it forces us to look at the tafsir of this surah in surahs that are similar to it. So for instance, you find وَالْمُرْسَلَاتِ عُرْفًا فَالْعَاصِفَاتِ عَصْفًا وَالنَّاشِرَاتِ نَشْرًا فَالْفَارِقَاتِ فَرْقًا فَالْمُلْقِيَاتِ ذِكْرًا عُذْرًا أَوْ نُذْرًا And then جَوَابَ الْقَسَمْ إِنَّمَا تُوْعَدُونَ لَوَاقِعٌ All of those oaths were taken for what conclusion? No doubt about it, whatever you have been promised is bound to occur. Whatever you have been promised is bound to occur. That conclusion is understood here because it's part of that chain of discourse. It's understood that when they hear these oaths, the next thing to expect is resurrection. But Allah Azza wa doesn't spell it out, which has benefits. One of the benefits is it forces you to look at other texts in the Quran. Al Quran yufassiru ba'dahu ba'dah. The other thing it forces to do is the, the person who hears oaths, they're expecting to hear what are these oaths about? What's he going to talk about? So now they're in more anticipation of what is to come. But Allah doesn't give them what they were expecting, so they keep on listening. They're keeping, they're, they're still haven't figured out what exactly is this thing about. So now Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks about the depiction of the day of resurrection. Here, before continuing, understand a com contrast with Surah Al Naba. In Surah Al Naba, in the beginning, we had Amma yatasa'alun an al Naba al Azim al Ladihum fihi muqtalifun. You know, there was a depiction of the skeptic. They're asking each other, "What is this? You know, when is this going to happen?" And you know, Allah threatens them, they will soon find out. And then he starts talking about the hereafter. So he spoke of the skeptic first, and the hereafter second. In this surah, he reverses the sequence. Here he mentions the hereafter first, and he will mention the skeptic later. That's later. So there's a reversal. This actually in Arabic literature is a, is a mechanism called that you fold something up, and then you unfold it in its reflection, or in the opposite. So you know how uh, the mirror, if you put an object before the mirror, they're exactly the same except they're organized opposite. You lift your right hand, the mirror's lifting the, the left hand, etc. Right, so that's the idea here. One surah is organized one way, and this will do the flipped organization of the ideas presented in Surah Al-Naba in many ways, one of which is this. يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَةً The ra you know, uh, rajif in Arabic is related to some other words, inshallah, we'll discuss some of these words in the Nah. The first thing to note is, Rajaf has to do with rattling or shaking. Okay? And there are a bunch of words in the Quran for this. And it's important whenever you come to a word that has other synonymous terms in the Quran that you should highlight the differences between them. Because it gives clarity to one particular text over the other. Other words that are used in the Quran, for example, Zalzala, Ida Zulzilat al Ardu, Zilzalaha. The origin of that word is from Zalla, which means you know, when someone's feet slip. And zalzala, because of the repetition of the, the, the phonetics, you know, in the, in the sounds, it actually alludes to repetition, meaning someone's feet keep on slipping, keep on slipping. When does that happen? During an earthquake. That's why it's called zalzala, because one's ke feet keep on tripping up. So that's one. The other is zaj. For, oh, oh, sorry, raj, sorry. Ida rujjatil ardu, rajja. Right, Allah Azza just speaks about raj. And this is actually an initial jerk. Like something was stationary, and all of a sudden it was put into motion. This is Raj. Ulama comment that this is the first moment of the experience of an earthquake. That's Raj. That's the very beginning of the experience of the earthquake. Then we have Mara. Yawma tamuru sama'u mawra. This is actually used when you are, for example, riding a horse, or you're running really fast, or somebody, some, a large animal passes by you running fast, and it simulates the feeling of an earthquake. It's not really an earthquake, but everything's shaking because of the rapid motion, that is called Mara. Finally, we come to the word that's used in this ayah. Allah says, يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَةً When that which is meant to rattle, Rajifa, the rattling one, will eventually rattle. Allah Azza wa did not here mention the earth. In another place in Quran, Allah says, يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الْأَرْضُ وَالْجِبَالِ تَرْجُفُ الْأَرْضُ وَالْجِبَالِ وَكَانَ فِي الْجِبَالُ كَثِيبًا مَهِيلًا The day on which the, 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 the land, the earth, and the mount, and you know, the large boulder mount, 
they are going to rattle. They're going to, they're going to shake and vibrate. As though they were katiba mahila, that they were sand dunes. When you, sh you know, when you shake a pile of sand, the sand keeps tripping over and falling off, right? As though they were that soft. That's how the earth is going to shake that Allah described. Imagine salt in a salt shaker, basically. That's the image that Allah depicts. But there he said, the earth and the, the mountains are going to shake. Here he said, يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الْأَرْضُ وَالْجِبَالِ No, يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَةِ Al-Rajifa means that which is meant to shake. What this illustrates is the purpose of the creation of the heavens and the earth. Its final destination is the point where it's going to shake. It's going to be rattled. This is its destiny. It can't be avoided. So much so that it's called Al-Rajifa. So much so that the fa'il isn't al ard wal jibal that it's Rajifa itself. So it's a profound declaration in the Qur'an about the reality of that shaking. Finally, just a comment about the word Rajaf. It's a highly uncomfortable motion and it actually doesn't just depict the motion itself it depicts the state of the one who is affected by that motion that they're in a state of discomfort and disarray now yawma tarjufu rajifa then allah says tatba'uha radifa it will be followed by a radifa radif in arabic implies you know when you're riding a camel or a horse and somebody sitting behind you then they are radif they're riding behind you people sitting in the back seat in your car nowadays they're radif they're following right along. Wherever you go, they're going because they're on the same ride. So Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that there's going to be, it'll be followed by another vibration, another jerking, another violent movement, one successively following the other, one meant to follow the other. A lot of the ulama are pretty much in agreement on this, uh, on this radifa, this following shaking and vibrating, that this, the first one is the, when the first time the trumpet will be blown. You know, in the previous surah we said, وَنُكِفَ فِي السُورِ Right, we've, we've heard those words. And now that's being opened up. That's, there's a tafsir of the previous text in the next surah. Okay, so now how many times will the trumpet be blown? Twice. The first one, يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّادِفَةِ Then the second one, تَتْبَعُهَا الرَّادِفَةِ So there's a long gap between them, but they are one to succeed the other one. One comes necessarily, the other's on its way. Radif literally implies, like we said, to sit behind. And you know, when words come one after another in meaning, that they're very close to each other in meaning, but they're not exactly the same, but they're still very close, they're called mutaradif. So synonyms in, in Arabic are called mutaradifat, for example. That's because they're very close to one another. Other words that speak of following in the Qur'an are khalfa. Khalfa actually refers to when you follow something chronologically. Meaning something came, then thereafter something else came, that's khalf. Uh, radif literally right behind, like we said, situa situated behind and moving along with. Then we have tala, which is to follow something carefully and repeatedly. Repeatedly. Like for example, it's used for the sun and the moon. Because the sun and the moon follow a path repeatedly. Anyhow. Khulubun yawma idhin wajifa. Allah says, on, first of all, the earth will violently shake when the trumpet is blown. And then the second time, it will be shaken another time. And this other time is when we will be raised. The first one was for death and the second one is for resurrection. So now, on the time of this resurrection, Allah depicts the first thing. He says, قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ وَاجِفَةً Hearts on that day, and actually قُلُوبٌ by mentioning it first, and not putting al on it, which is normally the case in Jumla Ismiya, by not putting al on it, there's an interesting nuanced meaning that's generated. Some hearts on that day, some hearts particularly on that day, will experience what Allah depicts as wajifa. Here, I know this is a long list, but I still want to illustrate this list, or, or at least express some of the meanings in this list before you, before we go into the word wajifa, because it's critical for you to appreciate the depth of the words in Arabic. One of my agendas in these durus is to, to try to highlight how incomplete translations are. How incomplete, even my own translation, how incomplete it is. Because how deep the words go, and how intricate the meanings are connected to one another. And we have to be careful in coming to conclusions about the tafsir of Qur'an. Allah Azza wa speaks about the word wajif. And most translations will say petrified, horrified, you know, terrified, scared. These are the words. Basically words associated with fear. Now here's some words in the Qur'an that are used for fear. Just, to, just so we know how they're different. One of the words used for fear is khawf. Khawf. You probably heard this word before. It's a very famous word. La khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. Khawf is used for a perceived danger. When you actually perceive a physical danger, then the word used is khawf. Another word is khashya. Like, wala taqtulu awladakum khashyata imla. Okay? Khashya is used when you are afraid of the magnitude of something. S specifically out of the magnitude of whatever is coming, that is scaring you, that is khashya. So khawf is more of a physical danger. 
while khashiya is a you know uh, the, the the greatness of something like the the magnitude of the implications of losing one losing one's job or the magnitude of the, the just the idea of day of judgment will lead you to khashiya for for example then there's the word khushu' which we use for example also in salat this is the fear that's manifest not only in your heart but it actually takes a hold of your face and your limbs this fear shows on your face and your limbs. It's an overpowering and an instilling kind of fear. And this is the kind of fear we're supposed to have in salah. That it actually, our faces have khushu, not just our heart. That the khushu comes out of the heart and it starts affecting other limbs of the body. Then there's the word taqwa, which is very common. Ittaqa yattaqi. This is to actually fear the consequences of one's actions. The fear, not, not something dangerous, but the consequences of what I'm doing myself. This is actually called Taqwa. It comes from wiqaya, which is to protect. And taqwa literally means to protect yourself from the consequences of your own future actions. Okay, That's how it's, it's really, uh, in, the lit, in the literary sense, it's understood. Then there's hadr, like hadr al-maut. Right? They, they are a fear of death. Again, the translation will say hadr means fear. But hadr is actually to, out of fear, to try to escape something or to be very careful of something. If you see something scary and trying to kind of escape it, this is hadr, this is that specific kind of fear, which means you're in proximity of the thing that is dangerous, or the thing that you're trying to get away from. Then there's ra'a, to startle, to, to startle someone. When you jump up on somebody, or you show up out of nowhere, or you, the person was just reading, and they unexpectedly heard the door open, the initial reaction is rawah. This is this fear immediate, but it subsides immediately also. This is the kind of fear that Ibrahim alayhi salam first felt when the angels came, but it departed from him. It left from him. This is Raha. Okay. Then there's Aujasa, or Wajas it, it, it comes from. And this is actually a fear when you hear something. You know, like you hear something, you get scared. Or you hear something that scared you. You hear some, some news or some event you overheard, and it scared you. This is Aujas. Also means to actually hide your fear within you. You don't let the person that is scaring you or the thing that is scaring you know that you're actually scared. Okay. نَكَرَهُمْ وَأَوْجَسَ مِنْهُمْ خِيفَةً This is actually spoken of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He saw them, he didn't recognize them, he didn't know who these guys are. So he was kind of scared, but he didn't let them see that he was scared. So أَوْجَسَ is used. He didn't let them see his fear. Then there's وَجِل. You know, إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِل is used. Now وَجِل is to have a fear that penetrates deep into your heart. A, fe a, a fear that penetrates into the very depths of your heart. That's وَجِل. Rahab is a fear mixed with, you know, uh, it's actually mixed with love. So it's a kind of fear you have of disappointing the one you love. When you're afraid of disappointing the person that you love, then rahab is used. Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks, for example, of believers saying, يَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا They call on us with inclination, they're inclined towards their Lord, and they're also afraid. But what kind of fear? The fear of disappointing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's rahab. Okay? Then finally, rahab. Uh, Rahab actually to be overwhelmed with intense fear. This is وَقَذَفَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمُ الرُّعْبَ Also Rahab comes from this, right? To have overwhelming, terrified fear of someone that makes you lose your reason. Then أَشْفَقَ uh, This is a kind of fear all of us have. This comes from, it's actually related to the word شَفِقَ عَلَى To have, you know, شَفْقَ over someone is to take care of them, to be concerned with their well-being, etc. Right? To show good to them. But then ashfaqa means that you're afraid that some harm will come to them. The one you're taking care of, you're also scared that some harm might come their way. So, so many different kinds of fear illustrated in so many different places where it's supposedly, where it's best situated in the Qur'an. Of all of these, finally, we come to the word wajah, which is قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ wajifa. That's the word that's used here. What is special about this kind of fear? It is a fear mixed with discomfort. And it actually, it's illustrated uh, the one who's feeling wajif is the one whose heart is pounding so hard they can feel it out of fear. That's when wajif is used. And this is also used when you, you, know, you strike your horse and its heart starts pounding and it races forward. So you say, awjaftul khayla. I made my horse you know, race forward by making its, its, heart, its, its heart race. So that's the kind of fear that Allah depicts on that day. When that second strike will fall, when that second shaking will occur, some hearts on that day will be basically beating out of their chest. That's the illustration here. قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ وَاجِفًا Especially on that day, some hearts will be beating out of their chest. The language, the, the sentence structure here also illustrates that these hearts right now, they're not scared. Right now they're at peace. They have no discomfort at all. But these, these are the very same hearts, especially on that day, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ 
they're going to experience this wajif, wajifa. And also wajifa is an ism fa'il, it's a nominal form. What that illustrates is, you know when your heart starts pounding, a few minutes later it comes to rest, it calms down. The choice of the word in the ayah illustrates their heart will start pounding and it won't come to rest. It will continuously keep pounding. It will keep, you know, the terror will, won't subside. قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ وَاجِفَةٌ Then Allah says something beautiful. He says, أَبْصَارُهَا خَاشِعَةٌ Again, depicting the terror of that day. You know, sometimes Allah depicts the terror of that day by things that are going to happen on that day, like the sun and the moon's collision and big, big things. Sometimes He depicts the terror of that day looking at the person and how scared they are. Not at the scary things that are happening, but their reaction to those things. So this is a surah that's highlighting more so the reaction to the events of the Day of Judgment of this person. Allah says, أَبْصَارُهَا خَاشِعَةً Their vision, the, the visions of those hearts, or the eye, their, their here refers to the hearts, not the people. Because it's not أَبْصَارُهُمْ, it's أَبْصَارُهَا. What this tells us is that the vision is directly connected to the heart. That's a very important reality to understand. What you see and how you perceive what you see is directly affected by what you have in your heart. When you have iman in your heart, what you see will be a reminder for you. When, you. when you feel the wind, when you see the sun, when you see the clouds, you'll get a reminder out of them. When you don't have iman in your heart, those same eyes will do nothing for you. So now on that day, people will not see except from a believing heart because now iman is haqqul yaqeen and ayn al yaqeen. They've seen it. So now those hearts, those eyes that are connected to these hearts now that are petrified, what's going to happen to those eyes? Khashia. They will be overpowered, overwhelmed. Humbled, their muscles will be relaxed. So these eyes will be overwhelmed by the fear that is going to be pre presented before them. Now this was the state of these some hearts, some hearts that don't feel any fear now, but they will fear this terrifying day then. Now immediately there's an iltifat, there's a transition. And this transition illustrates irony. The irony of the whole thing is, as it stands now, يَقُولُونَ أَإِنَّ لَمَرْدُودُونَ فِي الْحَافِرَةِ They say, a rough translation, they say, is it really the case that we're going to be returned to the original state? We're going to come back to life as we are now? Right back where we started is the expression we use in English. That's for hafira. You know, if somebody says, for example, in Arabic, fulanun raja'a ila hafiratihi, or fi hafirati. This is an expression in ancient Arabic. This person came back right where they started. So when they hear this whole thing about us coming back to life, our hearts pounding, you know, then the first reaction they have is, oh, come on, we're going to come back right to this again? We're going to be back here again? Some of the scholars commented on the word hafira, which is an important word here, but a couple of things here. Uh, number one, the word mardud. لَمَرْدُودُونَ Are we really going to be returned? But this rad refers to a kind of return when you go somewhere and you weren't expect, accepted and you were returned. Like you tried to cross the border and they didn't accept your paperwork and they sent you back. This is rad. So they're saying we're going to be rejected and sent back like this, like our death wasn't acceptable enough, now we have to be brought back to life. This is a means of sarcasm of the disbeliever. Then he says al-hafira. Al-hafira is literally from hufr, which is a, a ditch in the ground that you dig. Okay, or mihfar is actually a shovel. That's how it's used. So they're basically saying, you know, the, 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 the imagery in language, you have to understand imagery in classical Arabic is, you know, when you don't dig the, the ground, it's the way it's supposed to be. And then you make all this effort of digging it. And then you, you are asked to bring it back exactly where it used to be, back to normal again. So they're saying, come on, it's already, our, our graves are dug, we're set the way we are, we're not going to come out of this now. It's done deal. This resurrection after death doesn't seem like it's a very possible prospect. And it might have been possible, maybe I just died, right? My muscles are still intact, the only thing is I'm not breathing anymore, right? Maybe in a couple of hours, maybe somebody's able to revive me, I still might believe it. But you're talking about the time, even at the time when our bones will have been decayed to the point, nakhir means that the bone will be empty on the inside from, from decay. All that's left is a shell and air passes through it, right? And, and produces a, a smelly kind of an experience. When we're reduced to that much decay, you're saying we're going to be raised again? Now notice, before we said يَقُولُونَ أَإِنَّا لَمَرْدُودُونَ يَقُولُونَ is the present tense. They say and they will say. But قَالُوا is past tense. What this illustrates is this statement that we're about to read about was only made once or twice. It's lesser in, in its frequency. Okay, because الْمَرْضِ يَدُلُّ عَلَى الْحُدُوثِ Past and present in, in nowadays, when you hear past tense, you think of the past. When you hear present tense, you think of the present. 
in classical Arabic, past, present, future tense, they had different functions, not just timelines. They actually served the, func uh, the function of something being a one-time thing and something being a continuous thing. If it's a one-time thing, past tense. If it's continuous, present tense. For example, we find when Allah speaks about murder, you know, there are two kinds of murder, simply speaking. There's the guy who killed somebody by accident, and there's the guy who committed, you know, murder on purpose, homicide. So there's, you know, there's uh, manslaughter, which is kind of by mistake, and homicide, which is on purpose. When Allah spoke of manslaughter, when you kill somebody by mistake, he said, وَمَنْ قَتَلَ مُؤْمِنًا خَطَأً Whoever killed, past tense, killed a believer by mistake. When he speaks about killing on purpose, he says, وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا Whoever kills a believer on purpose. So what's the difference? The one who kills on purpose might do it again. There's going to be continuity. And may have done it before, so the present tense is more appropriate. And when the past tense is used for singular events, so the one who killed by mistake, chances are he's not going to do it again. He's not going to come back in two weeks and say, guess what, I made another mistake. It's not, that's not likely. So qatala is used. Here Qalu illustrates that some of them actually gave this some thought. They actually gave this some thought. Though, even though they said this in a sarcastic tone, it illustrates that some of them did reach the conclusion if, if there's a slight possibility that what you're saying is the truth, that we will be revived from death again, if that is even a, the slightest possibility, then they made the statement, Tilka idan karratun khasira. Then this is gonna be a karra, a return that is full of loss. Khasira. It, a, a return full of loss. It's gonna be a terrible return. Now, karra, the word literally doesn't just mean return. It actually, in Arabic, it's also used for attack. So this will be an attack on us. You know, the Arabs used to say there was one of the military strategies they had was called karra wa farra. What that means is you attack and you run away. Then you attack later and you run away. Right? This was a military strategy. So karra here, not just to return, but this will be attack against, an attack against us that's going to cause a lot of damage to us. Now, they're saying this in a sarcastic tone, but it actually illustrates at least they entertained the idea. At least once somebody entertained the idea that if this does happen, we will in fact be in very big trouble. قَالُوا تِلْكَ إِذَنْ كَرَّةٌ خَاسِرَةٌ Now Allah ends all of this discourse. All of this in, the, in Surah An-Naba, the way Allah ended that discourse was كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ Allah ended, it said, no, not at all. They're going to find out. We read about those ayat. Now Allah ends this discourse in another way. There he yelled at them directly saying they will find out. Here he says, فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ wahida. Then the, it's only going to take one yelling. Zajra really nowadays is you know, when a parent is yelling at their child, this is zajra. There are different kinds of yelling, but when it's very loud and it's offensive to the one you're yelling at, then zajr is used. You know, it's used against the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَقَالُوا مَجْنُونٌ وَزْدُجِرْ Right? That he, they said he's insane, and he was yelled at in order to make him run away. Like he, they, were, he, they started howling at him and, and cussing at him, Ma'adullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so that he would run off and not give them da'wah anymore. That's the ayah, was dujir. But here zajra is used. Zajra literally in the meaning of Allah Azza wa Jal will basically scold them, will scold them, and that scolding will be enough. Some, some have commented that this zajra is the blowing of the second trumpet. That that in itself is the scolding. That's all it's going to take. Zajratun wahida fa'idha hum bisahira. Then as a consequence, we know it's consequence because fa is, is fa sababiyya. It illustrates consequence. Then as a result, إِذَا all of a sudden, هُمْ sahira, They are going to be at this place that is in Arabic illustrated as a sahira. Let's talk briefly about what sahira means. Sahira literally, or sahir literally means that your sleep has disappeared. It's disappeared. You can't sleep anymore. And it was used in reference to an open field. So the Arab imagine is traveling and there's this open, open, open field as far as the eye can see. He's got nowhere to rest. So he sticks his bag on the ground. He lies down. But you know, when you can see far in the distance, he's worried if he goes to sleep, somebody will see him from a distance, come and rob him and run off. So he loses his sleep because he's not hidden. He's too exposed. So sahar was used in the reference of an open field and also in the, play, in the, in the sense of losing one's sleep because the two things are related to the Arab, to the Arab experience, okay? So now Allah speaks, they will be in this place where they will lose their sleep. Sahara also, it will be an open field. Here are some comments that the ulama have made about it. One is, we, we talked about the open field, also it's referred to as a mirage. Like one traveling in the desert and they see a mirage, and what do they see in the mirage? Water, right? So when, you, when you're almost asleep out of exhaustion in the travel of the desert, but you see a possibility of water in front of you, what happens to your sleep? 
It disappears. Now you can't sleep because now there's a goal in front of you. So some have commented Sahira is used for this reason. Other, others have said this is actually the field or the opening. And, and Sahir literally is a kind of ground that is pale, it's crusty, it's, it's one color, almost white, and it's flat, completely, completely flat, as far as the eye can see. This is a Sahira. And some have commented this is actually the field and the, and the land in which, in which all human beings would, will be gathered for resurrection. So فَإِذَاهُمْ بِالسَّاهِرَةِ Immediately they will be at the location of a Sahira. Uh, in Tafsir Haqqani we find one additional uh, 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 comment on this ayah. He says that this is like losing, uh, losing your sleep coming out of the grave. That as soon as that trumpet is blown, you will come out of your grave and lose your sleep forever. Because you know in another place in, in Surah Yasin, for example, مَنْ بَعَثَنَا مِنْ مَرْقَدِنَا Who has raised us from our place of sleep? Right? This has been used. So now their sleep is gone forever. Their sleep has been lost forever. Because once the paradise comes or, and the hellfire comes and the day of judgment comes, there's no more sleep. There's no more partial death. There's no escape from either the pleasures or the tortures. So فَإِذَاهُمْ بِالسَّاهِرَةِ هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى Complete shift of subject. You had in the beginning a few oaths regar regarding the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially in regards to the winds. We talked about last time a little bit about why the winds are important. I'll, I'll, I'll reca recap some things. The winds are critical because the Arabs said, what's this hereafter, this whole unseen punishments that you talk about that seem so far off? The closest thing to the unseen in the seen world is the wind. The closest thing that we can experience but we can't see is the wind. And Allah illustrates His power of destruction and His mercy by means of the wind. Some winds come and destroy entire towns. Other winds come and they are the means by which entire life on the earth is sustained. Right? So basically the idea is Allah doesn't need to make special arrangements for the kafir to bring some special military arrangement to bring him to punishment. All Allah needs to do is unleash his wind. That's enough for him. So what, what, whose power are you questioning? That's the idea of the winds being used as an oath. Then you come forward, Allah Azza wa Jalla started talking about the day itself. The day on which what your state of affairs is going to be. Watch what you're saying. Before Allah even mentions what he says, he says, your hearts are going to be like that that day. By the way, you seem to be talking, you know, all this trash now. Now, all of this, Allah brings to an end, takes us back to judgment again. All of them together, بِالسَّاهِرَة Now, you're not the first ones to rebel. You're not the first ones to be skeptics. You're not the first ones to poke fun at the truth and make smart comments. Allah turns His attention to His Messenger How do we know He turned His attention to the Messenger? هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى did the, did the news of Musa come to you, O Muhammad This iltifat, what this illustrates is, imagine there's an audience in front of us, right? Allah Azza wa Jalla is speaking, there's the, one of the audience is the believers, one of the audience is the disbelievers, part of the audience is the Messenger Himself uh, imagine there's a teacher. I'll put it in human terms. Imagine there's a teacher. He's got a, you know, in the auditorium, there's a section A, there's a section B, there's a section C, and there's the TA standing next to him. Right? Sometimes the teacher is talking to A, sometimes he's talking to B, sometimes he's talking to C, sometimes he's talking to the TA. Sometimes, for example, A did really well on the exam. So he's talking to B and he says to B, you know, you guys should be more like A. Right? So he's not talking to A, but he's talking about them even though everybody's listening. Sometimes he's telling his TA, don't worry about them, I know they're getting rowdy now, but you should relax, we'll get them under control or something. In other words, the, one, the, the true instructor, the true teacher has different audiences in different scenarios of education. Allah says about Quran, Allama al-Quran, he taught the Quran. And these are components of teaching. You talk to someone, when they're, when they're being bad students, when they're not listening, these people are poking fun, now Allah turns to Musa alayhi salam and starts talking to him instead. He talk, start, even though they're still listening, they learn now that Allah is no longer addressing them. He's tired of talking to them, pretty much in this discourse. So he turns to messenger, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi salam, he says, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ Musa?" The word hadith, which is interesting, Allah didn't say khabar, or Allah didn't say, you know, naba, or other words that are used in other places, hadith specifically. Hadith is used for something that is manifest, one. It is also used for something so old and it's forgotten that when you're reminded of it, it sounds like it's new, altogether new. And what the power of that word here is, when Allah says, did the hadith of Musa come to you? 
In other words, roughly translated, when they did the news of Musa come to you, you are being reminded of his legacy, and you will feel like this is the first time you're hearing it. That's how relevant it is to this discussion. That's how relevant it is to this discussion. That's why the word hadith is used. So did the hadith and the, the event of Musa, didn't it already come to you? إِذْ نَادَهُ رَبُّهُ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ قُوَى When his Lord called on to him. Nida in Arabic is to call someone loudly. So when his Lord forcefully called him, with a, with a tremendous voice, he called him. بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ In the sanctified valley, at taqdis in Arabic, like we do taqdis of Allah. وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ For example, right? Taqdis is to speak of Allah in a way that is appropriate of Allah. And to remove from Allah any attributions that are not appropriate to him. Muqaddas is a place, it can be a place that is specified for declaring the perfection of Allah. A place that is specially arranged, specially designed to, to exalt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, in, in, in simple English words, a holy place, right? Or a sanctified place is probably a better term. So bil wadil muqaddas, in the sanctified valley of Quwa. Already there's a parallel. Remember, Allah is talking to his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah's messenger called his Lord, by, without him even realizing, he called him to the, the cave of Hira. He called him to that cave, and he gave him revelation. Here he reminds him, Musa alayhi salam was called to the valley of Tuwa. Why, for what? For revelation. And then the revelation was given, اذهب إلى فرعون إنه طغى. Go to Fir'aun. Go to Fir'aun. Now, in other places we find فَأْتِيَا Fir'aun. Go approach Fir'aun all the way. Here it says, idhab ila, go to, head in that direction, meaning get started on your mission. The ila here illustrates, just get started on this mission right away. Okay, So, who is the messenger to go to? He's to go to Quraysh. He's to go to the disbelievers, just like Musa alayhi salam was to go to Fir'aun. Now, why was he to go to Fir'aun? Innahu taqa. No, there is no doubt that he has engaged in an act of rebellion. Tughriyan in Arabic is used when you, when, for example, if you have a pot, and you fill water in, but you put too much in and it starts spilling out, this is Tughiyan. Tughiyan is used for, for oceans when they start boiling over, like a flood. This is Tughiyan also. So there are limits set on a human being of the things they can do and say. When they cross those limits, they have engaged in Tughiyan. So he's done Tughiyan in two ways that we learn of in Quran. First, he declared himself Rabb. Second, he enslaved Bani Israel. Because when Musa السلام, came to him, he addressed two thing, these two things. إِنَّا رَسُولُ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ أَنْ أَرْسِلْ مَعَنَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ So these are the two great acts of rebellion of, of Fir'aun. Anyhow, so go to Fir'aun, he has rebelled, just like you people have rebelled. What this actually illustrates is, your problem really isn't that you don't believe in the hereafter, or you're skeptical. Your real problem is, just like was illustrated in the previous surah, your real problem is your love of rebellion. You don't want any limits put on you. You don't want to be told you can do this, you can't do this, you can live like this, you can't live like this. These are putting limits on you and you love your rebellion, your free lifestyle. Nowadays we call it freedom, right? We love our freedom, right? And a carefree lifestyle. This is what you're really in love with and that was the crime of Fir'aun before you. إِنَّهُ طَغَى فَقُلْ And we'll conclude with this ayah inshallah and conclude the surah after the uh, salah. فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَّى Then say to him, and this, this statement is very powerful. هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَّى the closest thing to it we can figure in English, halaka mailun, first of all, if there's a word understood here. Do you have any inclination inside you at all that you want to cleanse yourself of the filth that you are infested with? Do you have any voice of reason inside you that wants to make you a better person? Meaning the messengers, you know, their mission, their mission was, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ And other places, وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Tazkiya, purification was one of the core components of the word, work of the messengers. What does tazkiya mean, purification? It is to take the elements of one's personality that are flaws, that are evil, that are rebellious, and to cleanse oneself of them. So the question to ask Musa, that Musa a.s. asks Fir'aun, is the same question that is now to be put to the people who fear or who don't fear the hereafter. The real question is, do you find any voice of reason, any conscience deep buried inside yourself that tells you that you should become a better person? Is that little bit of a voice still alive? Because if it is, then there's hope for you. But if that voice is gone, then there's nothing left in you. There's nothing left making da'wah to. So it's not only that my message is convincing and my message has good reason. What part of the da'wah is, what is the goodness that is inside of you that is clicking with the message that I'm giving you? There has to be something inside of you that, that the two lights will come together, nurun ala nur. 
So فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَنْ تَزَكَّ Finally, inshallah ta'ala, as far as this word, the, the, the هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ It's a very powerful uh, expression in Arabic in that it illustrates not just the presence of goodness, but one's desire to bring out that goodness. One's desire to bring out that goodness. So Musa is asking Fir'aun, he's not questioning that there's a goodness because Allah put goodness inside of every human being. They deny that goodness, that's a separate story. He's saying, do you have any, any desire left in you to let that goodness in you flourish? This is basically the last resort. I've given you all the da'wah I could, and you've rebelled beyond all reason, but there still might be hope for you if you will let your own conscience be the better judge of the truth. Inshallah ta'ala, with this we take a break. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.